Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 549 for the 28th of April 2019. Richard Saunders here with you from sunny, 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 but nicely sunny Sydney, Australia. I say that when I mean by that, is it's a nice sunny day. It's not ridiculously hot, so you can walk around outside and not come back a sweaty mess. I do appreciate that. Coming up on this week's Spooky Skeptic Zone, we speak to Kenny Biddle, an investigator and columnist for CSI, and he recently did an investigation into these... Uh, so-called spirit boxes. Now, it's not a box with a spirit inside. That's an interesting thought. It's a radio that uh, scans the frequencies and uh, plays short bursts of each frequency. Anyway, you'll get the idea when we talk to Kenny. I include an example of what this spirit box sounds like. Can you communicate with the dead through technology? Probably not, but find out with Kenny Biddle coming up at the top of the show. Following that, we catch up with Susan Gerbeck from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. We often catch up with Susan at the moment, or when I did the recording a few days ago, she was in Scotland in Edinburgh as part of her UK tour with the mentalist Mark Edward. And I'm rather jealous of uh, Mark and Susan visiting the UK and uh, especially Scotland. Then to round off the show, a report from The Skeptic magazine diving back some years into a ghost investigation in Queensland. Haunted houses, mediums, and ghostly graveyards. Also in this week's show, somewhere in this week's show, Maynard tries a Twinkie. Yeah, I always bring back Twinkies from the United States. My nieces and nephews just love them. What does Maynard think of Twinkies? That that appears mm, somewhere in the show this week, I think, somewhere. A couple of quick announcements from me now before we get into the show. If you're in Sydney on the 4th of May, the Australian Skeptics have a free flu vaccination day, and that will be at the East Sydney Doctors. Uh, if you want to register to come along for that, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I did it last year. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. It's an odd way to think about it. Getting a flu vaccination is a lot of fun. I'll put a link in this week's show notes. And who knows, you might even end up on the skeptic zone. And my dear friend Eugenie Scott reminds us that the Skeptical One Day Conference is coming up on Sunday, the 9th of June in San Francisco. And early bird discounts for that uh, one day event ends on the 30th of this month. So only in a couple of days. To find out more about that event, follow the link in this week's show notes, or just visit www.skepticalcon, that's one word, dot com. And one last thing that just, and one last thing that just uh, popped up today, a memory, uh, from way back in 2013, my friend Rebecca Jones posted uh, the fact that she was in an audio adventure, Solar Flare. And if you haven't heard Solar Flare, it's something the Skeptic Zone did some years ago. As I said, it's a space adventure with the uh, the team from the Solar Flare or the team from the Skeptic Zone, as it was in 2013, battling uh, evil forces throughout the galaxy, including Jay Novella. Solar Flare and the Band of Power. And you can hear that um, audio adventure if you go to skepticzone.tv and scroll right to the bottom of the page. But now it's time for me to run downstairs and see if Maynard has left me any Twinkies. Well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Now, all the way from beautiful Philadelphia, historical Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, it's Kenny Biddle. Hello, Kenny. Hi, how you doing? 
I'm doing really well. You know what? I came across an article the other day in the Skeptical Inquirer, which really piqued my interest. And it's all about these so-called spirit boxes, which we'll get to in a moment. But just for the benefit of our audience, what are, what are your skeptical chops? What are your skeptical qualifications? My skeptical qualifications? <laughs> I am a curious person. <laughs> that's, that's really what it comes down to. I have a background in... Uh, mechanics. So I was an auto mechanic for several years. I worked in aviation and also in the medical industry. I'm back in the healthcare industry. So my entire background has been uh, coming out and trying to diagnose a problem and then fixing it. So I've translated that pretty well over to solving mysteries. And uh, I also have a background in phot- photography. I used to do like wedding photography and family portraits. So it all comes in handy when you're, you know, searching for ghosts and UFOs and stuff like that. Well, let's talk about ghosts for a moment because the topic of our interview really revolves around well, spirits and ghosts and things like that. Uh, I love go- I love ghosts, ghost investigations, haunting things like like that. I mean, I love the good old fashioned stuff. And you are still doing periodically uh, a podcast a podcast called Geeks and Ghosts. What's that all about? Well, that was, it actually started with a a friend of mine, just casual conversations. Uh, My co-host, Lou Castile, lives in California. So he's on the other side of the country. And we met through a paranormal conference. He (laughs) actually flew out to my side of the country and we met and we hit it off really well. And once a week we would get on Skype and just, we would chat while we were doing our own hobbies, I would be doing research and and writing articles and he would, he actually builds model tanks and we would sit there for hours and hours on Skype, just, just talking about pop culture and hobbies and ghosts and Bigfoot. And one night we just decided, Hey, why don't we just record it and see what happens? (laughs) That's great. That's just so um, organic in a way. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It's just two two friends just having fun, having a casual conversation, and we don't filter ourselves. We just say what we want to say. We say what's on our mind, and we record it, and we put it out there, and, you know, they're, they're, people listen, so it's fun. <laughs> That's great. Look, folks, I'll link to that in the show notes anyway. And talking about ghosts and things like that, uh, this, this article I'm referring to, again, links in the show notes, really revolves around what we know as a spirit spirit box, which we'll get to in a moment. But you must have uh, come across an interesting variety of so-called ghost detecting equipment. Yeah, there's there's a lot out there from EMF meters to using the Xbox Connect as a, a ghost finder. And then these radios that are, that's what they basically are. The spirit boxes are basically just radios and they, they fiddle with them so that you can hear the as they scan through the available broadcast, you don't get that muting uh, option. So it doesn't take out the static. You hear everything. It's, it's pretty much, I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself, but the old car radios and the old radios that I grew up with where you had to turn the dial in order to change the station, that's exactly what you're hearing. I well remember. That's how I grew up, too, where the, you just twiddle the knob, so to speak. You turn the dial, and you go through the yeah. frequencies. And in, in between each frequency, of course, each uh, each uh, station would be just, uh, just static. Look, folks, what I'll do now is I'll play a little clip of um, a spirit box in action. This is what it sounds like. So that's it, folks. And as you can hear, it is rapidly, this, this device is rapidly scanning frequencies. And how does it work exactly? Does it, does it, Kenny, does it find uh, a station, lock on for a split second, then move off? Or is it just randomly going through any frequencies? It's going through the stations. It, it, it's linear. So it goes 
from the, the lower frequencies up to the higher frequencies. Uh-huh. But it just goes through. It's, it's, it's exactly as if you just turn the dial. And it doesn't stop on the, the stations or the broadcast that it, it picks up. It just keeps going through them. So not only are you getting snippets, little clips of each station, which can amount to half a word to two or three words, but you're getting the bleeding over from station to station. So you can get a blending of stations and a blending of broadcasts, which means you can get a few words from one station and a few words from another station, which some ghost hunters would interpret as a full sentence. Yeah, and this when uh, really uh, this is where we bring up the topic of uh, pareidolia and audio pareidolia in this case, and people hearing things that they want to hear or hearing something and interpreting it as something that sort of kind of makes sense to them. And you go into this in the article, don't you? Yes, yes, uh, because there is it's so easy just to pick out words because you're listening, you're you're literally listening to radio broadcast. So that means. Music, commercials, news stations, um, any kind of broadcast that's out there. So you're going to have names and dates and places, locations. You're going to have all these words coming out. And if you're if you're a ghost hunter, and, and not all ghost hunters do that. I just want to make that clear. Not all of them do it, but a lot do. And if they're at a haunted location and they're they know the history, they know the ghost stories, and they're listening to all these random noises, I guarantee they're going to pick out answers to their questions it's just it's just happens yeah you're absolutely right i've seen this in action on a ghost uh, investigation i f- did in fact about five years back in a graveyard at night time we were wandering around and the uh, the paranormal group i was with at the time investigating or just hanging out with i had a spirit box and out it came and and, and away it went and they would ask questions and then they would listen to 30, 40, 50 seconds of this spirit box churning away. And every now and then you would hear half a word or a full word. And then it's, ah, oh, you see, they're saying dead or they're saying this or they're saying <laughs> the other. Now, you did an interesting series of tests involving headphones. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, yeah, yeah. Part of the uh, the article topic um, was that the person suggested that you use noise-isolating headphones in order to block out all the sound around the area, the ambient sound, and also to listen to the spirit box radio. And I, 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 had, a, I had this idea like, all right, he's telling you to use noise isolating, not noise canceling. So there's a big difference. Noise canceling, actually, it's an active system where it, there's a microphone in the headpiece, the, the earphone piece, and it reads the ambient noise and it actually makes a reverse signal, so it cancels out all the noise. So when you put noise-canceling headphones on, it literally blocks out everything. It's almost like a freaky little feeling when you put them on. But Yes. Noise- in, in fact, I've been using those uh, on long-haul uh, airplane flights. They're quite good. They block out the, uh, the noise of the engine. Yes, yes. Uh, but noise-isolating headphones are completely different. They depend mostly on the seal uh, around the ear. Uh, that the cushion that's on the earpiece that goes around your ear, it relies on that to block out a little bit of the ambient noise. And most of the time, it's about 20 to 25 decibels, which isn't a lot, um, considering that normal voice is about, uh, the normal human voice is about 60 to 70 decibels. So it's not going to block at, block that out. But I wanted to test it for myself. And, and I actually went to one of the local uh, electronic stores here in the States called Best Buy. And I walked in and they have a uh, large display of all these headphones and I started putting them on and every one that I did, I could still hear conversations in the next aisle. I could still hear the music that was playing on speakers a good 20 feet above me. So it didn't block out anything that would, that would uh, say, for, for instance, uh, if somebody was next to me asking questions of ghosts, I would still be able to hear them. And, and a f- funny part of that story is that one of the salespeople came up to me and asked what I was doing and if they could help me. And I, I honestly told them, this is what I'm here for. There's a ghost <laughs> hunter that says this blocks out all the noises and they're trying to get ghost voices, but not listen to other people. And that sparked a whole conversation. There was, I think there were ended up being seven or eight 
employees that came over and we were all p- testing them, all putting them on. Everybody's talking. It, it was a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I love about being a skeptic. And it's interesting to think that, I mean, in the mind of the ghost investigators, there's this disembodied people, if you can put it that way, disembodied spirits or spirits or or entities or something like that. They're floating about, probably near a graveyard. And you turn up with your spirit box and the ghosts think to themselves, ah, here here it is. We'll use this. We'll manipulate the airwaves uh, to to uh, bring our messages forward. I mean, you've got to give them credit for some imagination to come up with something like this. <laughs> I, I agree. Because, I mean, <laughs> I, I can't do that without a whole bunch of equipment. I need, <laughs> I need equipment to do that. I can't just do that by myself. So for a ghost to do that, I mean, that's, that's impressive. That's <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're they're all ghosts of electrical engineers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's great. Look, it's it's a fascinating story. Uh, it's a good report. I really enjoyed reading it, folks. I recommend it to you. And if you ever have the opportunity, folks, to go out on a ghost investigation, uh, why not? It's a lot of fun, apart from anything else. And you do learn something. You learn something about psychology. Uh, and you get to see these strange and uh, interesting ghost hunting equipment in action. And there's, right. all, there's all sorts of meters and uh, things they use. Uh, you, you were saying EMF meters before. It's never-ending. Well, Kenny, it sounds like you've been having a lot more fun than me lately looking for the ghosts. And oh, maybe we can chat again soon. But for now, thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, hi, Maynard. Oh, hi, Heidi. Great day in this park. Yeah, if you like that sort of thing. Look over there. A yowie. There are no such things as yowies, silly. Hmm. Might be just a dog. A big dog. I think it's a King Charles Spaniel thing. Hmm. No, 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 no. no. It's a yowie. Maynard, if it's a choice between it being a dog or a yowie... No, 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 it's a yowie. Yowie, 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 yowie. Argument from authority. It's a yowie. Hey, you two, what are you arguing about? Maynard thinks that dog-looking thing over there is a yowie. A yowie? Or maybe Chewbacca the Wookiee? I see. Okay, we better look this up in the Skeptic's Dictionary online. The The what? what? The Skeptic's Dictionary Online it features definitions, arguments and essays on hundreds of strange beliefs, amusing descriptions and dangerous delusions. It also features dozens of entries on logical fallacies, cognitive biases, perception, science and philosophy. It's at www.skepdic.com. Right, Hardy. Prepared to be amazed. Okay, yowie. Ah, here it is. It's under Bigfoot. It says, Most scientists discount the evidence of Bigfoot because the evidence supporting belief in the survival of a prehistoric biped ape-like creature of such dimensions is scant. You know, maybe that is just Chewbacca after all. Thank you, Skeptics Dictionary Online. Joining me now all the way from beautiful Edinburgh in Scotland, the land I dream of, it's Susan Gerbeck from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Hello, Susan. Hi, everybody. Hi, Richard. Nice to catch up with you again. The last time we spoke, you were very excited about an upcoming trip. Gorilla Skepticism on the road, as it were. Uh, Where have you been and what have you been up to? Well, Mark Edward and myself have been to Cardiff. We've been to Portsmouth, we've been to London, York, 
and Glasgow, and now we're in Edinburgh. That's quite a busy trip. And what was the main purpose for this trip? Well, we were actually coming over to go to a prisoner conference in Port Marion, Wales. That's that old 60s uh, sci-fi show that some people will have um, remembered from the from the 1960s. And we decided we'd put together a tour and go and see some skeptic groups and speak and meet people and hang out and see what's going on in the UK. A bit of a guerrilla skeptical outreach, I see. And uh, what, what does this involve? Just you giving talks and, and Mark doing seances, I think. Yeah, actually, we have been doing talks together. He's been talking about um, psychics and when psychic entertainment isn't entertainment. And I've been talking about the GSOW Wikipedia project. And then now that we're in Edinburgh, uh, Mark's doing seances. He's got a couple more scheduled for this weekend. Well, that's pretty exciting. Uh, What does that involve exactly when Mark does a seance? Well, they're more of a Victorian seance. He does a lot of research about the area in Edinburgh. And he finds, you know, some story... Uh, murdered somebody or somebody who was a villain and he does research on it and does a Victorian seance and we do it in total darkness. Ooh. It's a lot of fun. It really is. That's interesting you should say that because recently has come to my attention there's been some footage uh, put on the internet of a so-called psychic doing uh, a mystical seance all in the dark and lo and behold the footage was taken with night vision and it shows us the the, uh, the so-called medium just stepping out of his binds his, his, his uh, bindings or whatever they are and running around and, and uh, basically faking it have you seen that? Oh yes I've seen that and that has been that was really interesting very blatant um, what Mark is doing is obviously seances, but um, it's all wink, wink, nod, nod. We, you know, the audience knows what's going on. There's no hiding. Yes, absolutely. So I guess it's more for fun and entertainment and uh, importantly, oh, definitely. Uh, education yeah. too. Yes, absolutely. It is for fun and entertainment and um you know, we don't usually bring back the dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not usually, anyway. Uh, not so usually. I, <laughs> uh, and how is the uh, guerrilla skepticism your your part of the uh, the tour being received? Right. It's so it's a little early to find out if we have any new recruits from the UK. Mm-hmm. I really am hoping that they will uh, contact me. But um, usually, we it's a few days afterwards that people who are interested in joining will actually reach out and join so who knows um i really do need more people from the uk we have so many australians and so many americans and not so many people from the uk it's very very sighted you know it's but people are responsive they are enjoying the lecture they're asking good questions and they are giving me a lot of feedback and um they are appreciating the work that my team does. That's excellent. Have been uh, have you been getting many comments or questions about your recent uh, uh, article in the New York Times or the article that uh, mentioned you? Well, that is interesting. All of the different um, posts that we've had, all the different skeptic groups, have brought up the New York Times article um, in their advertisement that we're going to be speaking. And then whenever we get to the lecture, a lot of people, most of the group, haven't read it or know what we're talking about. It seems that a lot of these meetups, people just come to the meetups regularly. That's their their thing. And they don't okay. really know who the speakers are. they just attending the lecture as they always do for social, you know, to socialize or whatever. And so, no, a lot of people are not aware of what we do and a lot of people don't know what the GSOW project is. It's it's really been interesting how few people even know um, what we're going to be talking about. And for those people who who may not have heard you on the show earlier, what we're talking about is a, a little while ago, uh, Susan was involved in a, a sort of an undercover operation to uh, uh, using fake 
information planted on Facebook to show that a medium was in fact using the psychic network of the internet rather than the psychic network of the other realms, so to speak. Yes, that was all very interesting. And uh, is there any further developments on that sort of front you can tell us about? Well, we have a plan. We have um, we have a really, really great plan set up. But um, the media seems to be balking at it. We, we're trying Ooh. to find a strong media to cover it and help pay for it. It's very expensive what we want to do. Wow. And um, we, we're we tired of preaching to the choir. So everything I'm trying to do when it comes to psychics nowadays is going to be with media coverage in hand. We're going to already have the media coverage. And, um, you know, it's pretty daring what we're going to do. So, And I can only do it one time because once it's done... Um, all the mediums are going to be aware of what we're we're about to do. So I'm trying to. So we're kind of holding off right at the moment, waiting for the perfect opportunity with a um, news media, and then of course the funding is going to be quite a bit. It's about twelve thousand dollars. Ooh, ooh. Well, I hope you can keep us updated um, when oh, it's over. Definitely. Presumably, because we don't want to give anything away. Oh, that's going to be interesting, folks. There's something to look out for. <laughs> There's something to look out for in the future. Well, uh, good that you're having a good time. I'm glad the tour has been successful for you and Mark Edward in the UK. And, uh, well, hopefully one day in the not-too-distant future, we'll see you back here in sunny Australia. Oh, yes, absolutely. But for now, from... Uh, One of the most uh, enchanting cities, surely, in the world, Edinburgh. Susan Gerbeck, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Talk soon. Allora, ciao, io mi chiamo Professore Dave, io ti voglio insegnare tutte le cose sulla scienza. Parliamo di fisica, di chimica, biologia, astronomia, matematica e tante altre cose. Guardami su YouTube. Arrivederci. Hey everyone, this is Professor Dave. I want to teach you about all kinds of things regarding science. I want to tell you about physics. I want to tell you about chemistry, biology, astronomy, math, and many, many more things. Come check me out on YouTube. The channel is called Professor Dave Explains. Take it easy. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave Explains. Continue our series of reports and articles and items and things like that from the Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics. This week we're going back to 1989, volume 9, number 3. And on page 25 we find Skeptical Investigations Experiencing a Ghost House by Greg Thompson. And of course, this reminds us that skepticism isn't about sitting back and reading books. Well, it is partly, of course. It is about investigation. During January this year, I was invited to witness the expulsion of spirits from a haunted house outside Bow Desert near Brisbane. I had the opportunity of meeting the medium, Glennis, who could supposedly communicate with lost souls who had died but never passed through the light on the other side. These souls were, therefore, still roaming around on this world and frequently performing mischievous deeds. I was invited to attend by my friend Nikki, who is a professional photographer. She was there to photograph the ghosts in the house for a reporter, Joan, who was covering the event in order to publish ghost stories in the picture magazine and elsewhere. 
On the way there, the reporter explained that there was no doubt in her mind that supernatural things must occur. The reporter had previously told us of the medium's involvement with a, quote, scientific study, end quote, of metaphysical events conducted by Queensland University. On questioning the medium herself in the car, she informed me that it was actually a chap from Griffith University who investigated one of her contacts with the other side. She ridiculed him because he could find nothing supernatural during her performance. I did not let on that I was a skeptic, so I could see a typical spirit exorcism. They recounted how the reporter supposedly was pushed out of the room by a ghost on their last encounter. This sounded too good to be true, so I was looking forward to either a good exhibition or, if my luck could be so good, a truly amazing physical phenomenon that would bear serious scientific investigation. We arrived with a large chain of electrical storms lighting up the southern horizon. Before we got out of the car, Glenis warned us of the history of this evil house. The medium wanted us to believe that there had been a string of gruesome murders and suicides, all of which seemed so far over the top that they were most likely taken out of horror comics or B-grade horror movies. As an example, one fellow suicided by hanging himself on meat hooks. Another had stabbed his Alsatian dog to death under the house, etc., etc. When we stepped outside the car the medium saw a blue and white light coming out of the distant bush. She said they were probably spirits arising from the cemetery in that direction. I suggested that it would be more likely that those lights were simply street or house lights further down the road. She agreed that was a possibility and that we should investigate before leaving later that night. Not only did this house have ghosts, but last time she was there... UFOs were seen coming and going in the western sky. It seemed I'd hit the jackpot. As we were about to pass through the front gate, she told us we'd feel and smell the evil of the place, just as she'd done on previous occasions. She went in first, followed by myself. As she predicted, she shuddered at the gate and said she could feel it was going to be a bad night. I couldn't help feeling this was for my benefit to get me in the mood by the power of suggestion. If it was, it didn't work. I felt nothing and told her so, and went on to meet the people who live there. Haunted House The house was rented by a Maori woman in her early thirties, her sixteen-year-old son, and two daughters about twelve and eight years old. The husband was away, and they were glad, as he thought the whole thing was a load of hogwash. The lady's mother and father were also there, as well as the medium's husband, who had arrived to assist her. The house was a typical small weatherboard home on 1.5 metre stumps, with two tanks, a front veranda, and in need of some simple repairs. The medium first proceeded under the house to find the ley lines with her wire sticks, usually used for so-called water divining. What this had to do with ghosts, she couldn't explain. It seemed like nothing more than a meaningless preamble, attempting unsuccessfully to impress her small audience. She lost interest when I remarked that I too knew how water divining worked. I asked her if she'd seen a documentary on TV a few years ago where the country's best diviners gathered at North Ride for the $30,000 prize money available for diviners who could consistently find underground water. The diviners believed it was a cinch until they were tested scientifically, only to find that not one of them could get much above chance, let alone a hit every time. As an aside, of course, he's referring to the documentary James Randi in Australia from 1980, a classic of water divining and uh, sceptical investigations and testing. And if you just Google James Randi in Australia, you will find that documentary on YouTube. We read on. On entering the house, 
She explained to the family that she got rid of the ghosts last time and that they shouldn't be afraid. I asked if she could get rid of them permanently. Oh, yes, she replied firmly. Then why are we here now? I asked innocently. In contradiction to her previous statement, she replied that they can come back, especially if you need to justify a bit more photography for a story, I thought. Strangely, this family, which reportedly was so affected by the ghosts, seemed not the least bit perturbed to me. The Exorcism The medium walked into one of the bedrooms and asked me to hold her torch. Her husband stood close to her, and soon she began to quiver and go into an apparent trance. She then muttered some aggressive words in a distorted voice, and thrashed around a little while her husband stood behind her telling the spirit possessing her that it must go to the light where it can find peace and pass through to the other side. It must have done just as he suggested because she soon recovered as she slumped in a chair. The medium and her husband kept commenting that the spirit was a real bad one. If that meagre episode was so bad, I hope they never go and see the movie Poltergeist, as they would surely have a cardiac arrest before half-time. I must admit to a great temptation to bung on a really good acting job together with some special effects, lighting, sound, to make them think a real wild spirit had possessed me and scare the hell out of them. It would have been most interesting to see such people's reaction, especially if the spirit condemned them for faking contact with its world and warned them never to do so again. This boring show was conducted twice more that night. Most of the household didn't even bother to watch. I didn't blame them if they'd seen it before. Earlier that night, I was told by the reporter that the medium's voice changed completely from one spirit to another, and she could talk with accents and slang peculiar to the earliest settlers, so I looked forward to this aspect of the night's entertainment. I was bitterly disappointed. Our medium simply distorted her voice to sound lower and more gravelly or menacing, regardless of whether it was a male or female spirit. The lack of creativity was appalling. The final spirit cleansing was done in a bedroom where the photographer had asked me to replace the hanging light bulb with a UV light bulb for effect. This was the climax, so she had to fall to the floor with this one. Much to the disappointment of myself and the reporter, all the medium's husband could say was, quote, go to the light, end quote. No questions were asked. The spirit snulled and said to us, quote, you all think this is a joke, don't you? End quote. Ghosts. The reporter claimed that she saw an elderly woman lying on the bed and hoped the camera had recorded it, even though no one else could see it, including the medium. The reporter and the medium couldn't agree about the appearance of the ghost. Lo and behold, nothing extraordinary turned up on the film. It was said that the two young girls had been terrified by a ghost which had lifted the end of their bed and shaken it so violently that they were being thrown up and down. This sounded impressive, the stuff I was looking for. I asked the girls on their own if they had seen any ghosts, whether they had ever had the bed shake or been thrown off, and they answered no to all my questions. During a discussion with everyone in the lounge, it became apparent that the grandmother was the main perpetrator of these tales. She was the one who would see the ghosts in detail going to have a shower and other such things. The boy had heard only some noises. The Maori grandfather believed, but had not seen them, and his daughter said she believed in ghosts, but had difficulty recounting convincing occurrences. The grandmother was scaring the youngest girl by making her believe that the house was full of ghosts and that she would protect her granddaughter if any tried to kill her. I thought this was a bit much. The children's mother had baked a cake for the occasion 
and seemed to me to be treating the ghost as simply an excuse for some visitors and the possibility of some small degree of notoriety in a pulp magazine. I reminded them that we should investigate the spirit lights in the cemetery before leaving, even though the storm was just breaking overhead. On reluctantly driving down the road, they were disappointed that the lights were coming from some houses past the cemetery. On returning past the cemetery, the medium exclaimed, quote, Did you see that? People or things moving about the cemetery. End quote. We reversed and got her spotlight from the boot. It was simply the reflections of our headlights off the wet headstones. On the way home, even the reporter and the medium said that they were of the opinion that, quote, the grandmother brings the ghosts with her when she comes and takes them home when she leaves. And there is a picture accompanying this story of a very brightly lit background with the foreground, somebody standing in the foreground. It's not very clear. And the caption says, Medium Glennis McKay standing in front of a ghostly apparition. She and author friend Joan Starr believe that the brilliant light in this photograph is proof of a ghost summoned by the medium. They claim that the ghost's eyes are slightly darker hollows silhouetted against the ceiling and its shoulders and arms are the portions extended beyond the edge of the room and across Glennis's face. They believe that no light was on at the time of the exposure and the light source was that of the ghost. In fact, on obtaining the negative, it was discovered that the light hanging in the centre of the passageway was on, reflecting off a painting behind the medium's face, a door at the end of the hall, the opposite wall of the passage, and the ceiling where undulations created the eyes of the ghost. And that was Experiencing a Ghost House, written by Greg Thompson, way back in 1989, so 30 years ago, volume 9, number 3 of The Skeptic Magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics. so much more in the pages of the skeptic magazine at skeptics.com.au thank you for listening to the skeptic zone podcast Uh, That was episode 549. Next week will be episode 550. 550. I guess that's a milestone, a kilometer peg, however you want to say it. I'm not sure what it means. I think it means that we're going to have some interviews and reports as normal. Uh, This episode, I had hoped to speak to Jessica Singer about uh, her experiences in uh, London, in Skeptics in the Pub. Well, that interview has been held over until the next show. I also hope to chat to our friends from the Merseyside Skeptics, who uh, are going to be celebrating 10 years. And of course, I'll be bringing you a report from the Flu Vaccination Day. And that, just to remind you, is on the 4th, Saturday, the 4th of May, Star Wars Day here in Sydney. And again, if you'd like to come along, if you're in Sydney for your flu vaccination i'll be rolling up my sleeve in more than one way uh there'll be a link in this week's show notes actually following the flu vaccination day i'll be heading for maynard's love shack number two hope to see you at both events thank you to those people who uh support the skeptic zone via paypal or patreon thank you to my recent patreon uh people only in the last week thank you very much great to have you on board And if you're not on board with uh, Patreon or PayPal, well, I would encourage you to do it, even if you do it for a couple of months, two, three, four months. uh, It really does help the Skeptic Zone keep going. And you can do that at skepticzone.tv. But for this week, until show number 550, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. Did somebody say Twinkies? You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. 
Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organization. Hold on, folks. Hold on. I'm with Maynard here, and we are just trying, or Maynard's trying Twinkies for the first time. Maynard... Look, all these Americans that say smart things about mustics. Ooh, mustics. They taste like deer poo. Well, Twinkies are not much better. Let me tell you, I've been having two of these, and they're not unflavorful, but they're horrible. Um, They've got shaving cream inside them which is flavoured by some non-dairy petrochemical byproduct um, that, um, it's, yeah, look, it's OK. Um, look, if you're... Well, on, you've had two, right? I've had two. You had to have an, one, but you had to have another one just to make sure, right? Yes, and there was 260 calories in that because they're American. Killer jewels, people, get with it. There's <laughs> only you and one small island in the Caribbean that still uses Imperial. But you, and you, since you, you had a revolution to kick out the English and the king, how come you're so quick to adopt the Imperial? Imperial measurement system. And by the way, wasn't that who Darth Vader was with? I think that's right. Mm. But you were just laughing when you were reading the nutrition. Oh, yeah, let's just read that out here. Um, uh, this is two Twinkies, which is uh, two of the cakes wrapped up. Which you, you've had. Which I've had. And, uh, and as time goes on, there's an aftertaste to them. So I can understand if you didn't like the musk stick, which is an Australian thing, you'd spit them out. I could understand that now, having some of this uh, alleged cream that's in them. But I love how there's like dietary fibre, zero. <laughs> Vitamin A, zero percent. Vitamin C, zero percent. Calcium. 2% and there is 4% iron that was probably deposited there by the machines that made the machine. Well, the, yeah. If it doesn't have something like vitamin A and vitamin why C, put it why put it there? I think you would find there's a labelling requirement that most foods of mm. a certain type have to have that. So even if it's zero, you should be letting know that you aren't getting any of that. Too. I must admit, th- these are the, the standard Twinkies we're trying at the moment, which is the, the goal, it's, what does it say? Individually wrapped cakes, golden sponge cake with creamy filling. I do like their mascot, but yes, uh, Twinkie the Kid. Twinkie the Kid. Twinkie the Kid. He's sort of wearing um, a sort of eighties uh, gay disco outfit kind of thing, <laughs> and he's got a double bandana on, and it's off to one side, which probably means something in the hanky code. Now I know. You don't know what the hanky code is, but believe you me, listeners out there, check out the hanky code on Twinkie the Kid and uh, you'll find out what he's into or not into. I really don't know about these things, folks. But I tell you what, I did also bring back to Australia, I brought back these golden sponge Twinkies and I brought back chocolate Twinkies. Chocolate. And I tried one and I must admit, if I had to choose between the two, I would choose the golden ones. Yeah, and how many calories was then them? Even okay. more, I imagine. Probably, yes. Right. <laughs> yes, well, look, I, I just look at them and look, Twinkies are what made America what it is today.